everybody, and welcome back to the Brando and Joe podcast. For today's podcast episode, our guest is Dr. Andre Martin. He received his PhD in organizational psychology from St. Louis University, is the founder of ShiftSpace, has previously worked for Accenture, Google, Target, and Nike, and is the author for the upcoming book, Wrong Fit, Right Fit. Welcome, Andre. Hey, fellas. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks welcome. for talking with us. We're uh, excited that you talked to us through your busy, uh, you're just recording your audio book, right? For um, I- Wrong Fit, Right Fit? I just got back uh, from Burbank, let's see, Thursday, after a three-day grind in, in recording the Audible version. I have to say, writing it was one thing, but the, the actual recording of it is terrifying. Well, that was my question. Is it tough to like hear yourself like uh, talking about the things that you wrote? Because I know sometimes Brandon and I talk about, we're like, listening to us, like our recordings of the past podcast. I was like, oh, turn it off. Like, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Back in the days of like uh, voicemail messages and answering machines, you used to record your own message. I hated hearing myself back. And so in the studio, you it's all you do. You're listening to yourself for two days straight. And so you finally get to the point that you appreciate your own voice, but it takes a while. Oh, and like you have to like redo it. And like if you mess something up and then just... Uh... And, and the engineers in your in your headphones all day long saying, hey, you missed this. Restart here. Go back here, and so you're you're just on repeat. It is a time flies by, but I got to say, I'm not. I although I had a great engineer, not super excited about being back in the studio again anytime soon, except for a podcast like this, of course. <laughs> yeah, that makes us excited. I'm, I'm glad, glad we could be the exception. There you go. <laughs> uh, but that's exciting. I mean, it's a it's a cool book that you're coming out with, Wrong Fit, Right Fit, which I know is going to be like the main content of this episode. Um, but I guess what, what was your like initial inspiration for wrong fit, right fit? Like what kind of gave you this idea to like talk about engagement in the workplace and like having people find their right fit at a company? Yeah. So it's a really interesting story. So the publisher that, that asked me to write the book originally wanted a book on culture in this sort of new era of work, post COVID hybrid return to work, all the rest. And so after 25 years of being in the field, I thought, God, what a great opportunity to talk about culture. What are the best practices to, to building the best place to work? And so I did what most researchers do, which is I reached out to my immediate network just to have conversations and get a feel for like, what could be my angle? How could I come into that conversation? And what I found really quickly was there isn't really a good or bad culture, right? Cultures are simply the aggregation of all of the behaviors of all the people working in the company. It's outcome. And what what came through those conversations was there's actually a more important conversation to have, right? And that is, do the way that you like to work fit the place you're actually working? The ways you like to collaborate, sell through ideas, manage conflict, get feedback, get developed, socialize, gather, all those things. Those are the things that make up the engagement in the workplace. And then the other part that was really compelling was this $7.8 trillion of lost productivity that sit in our companies today due to disengagement, due to people who are great at their craft and they don't feel valued enough to come in and show their best every day. That's 7.8 trillion. That's a, (laughs) that's a big number and that's tough to stomach. Um, When I hear what you're talking about there, in terms of like people fitting in their jobs and what they're trying to do. It kind of reminds me of a conversation that I know Joe and I had when we were going through our interview process for all of the programs we were looking at. It's like, we're not just looking at something that fits for us. We're also, they're looking what fits for them and it has to go back and forth. It's like creating that relationship building. Like, is that something that you're kind of thinking about in terms of engagement and how people can find that PO fit, that PJ fit when they're trying to apply to these jobs? Yeah, Brandon, I think it applies to universities as well, frankly, right? So there's sort of a few big buckets of content, best practices, tips, tricks that I'm I'm sharing in the book. The first one is you got to know yourself really well. Whether you're applying to a university program or to a job, most people start those by looking at the university or the job spec. And the first thing they need to do is really get centered on who are you? What do you value? What are the things you bring that are unique? Who do you like to work for? And how do you like to work? And that step, man, it just changes your whole orientation to the places that you're thinking about joining, right? Then the second one is is just this whole idea. And this is especially true in the job search. I don't know if it is in universities, but 
job searches have become more marketing than they have an honest conversation about who we are, right? Go to any career site out there for almost any company. They are aspirational and beautiful. And it's like the company on its best day. And then if you take a candidate, our orientation is we got to show up at our best. We got to be buttoned up, have the perfect answer, be exactly what they're looking for. And when you think about those two ideas, they don't lead to us getting to right fit. They lead to us sort of presenting not a false version of ourselves, but maybe not a totally true one either. Hmm. And now you say like we, we show up, we have to like kind of be this perfect version of ourselves. And then we kind of see what these companies have to offer. And when you're talking about that, one of the things that remind me is I think in Brandon, you have to correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was like one of our org classes we learned about like espoused and enacted values of like yeah. kind of like what the company shows and like what they're actually doing like behind the scenes. Um, is there, I guess my question is like in your research, is there a way for when we're looking for that like job and that, that culture that they offer is there a way for us to see like what those values that the company really has to offer? Um, because I might know myself like perfectly and I'm like, I like, I know what I like and I'm like, Oh, I match up to this company super well, but you know, in reality, maybe I don't actually. Yeah, Joe, there's a couple really important ideas in, in kind of the insight you're having. The first one is comes in this idea of a spouse versus actual value. So MIT and Culture 500 just did a fascinating piece of research. I think it was about a year and a half ago. And they basically took all the espoused values of some of the top culture companies out there. And so they measured that through all of the sort of assets that are public to any company and how often they mention certain values. So they were able to sort of not just um, ascertain what those values generally were, but also weight them based on how often they were mentioned. And then what they did is they took those espoused values, the things that companies talk about, and they compared them to the experiences that were showing up in the employee review sites, like Glassdoor and Indeed and Comparably. And what they found is not only is there no correlation or small correlation between those things, there's no correlation. And in some instances, there's a negative correlation. And so basically the whole thing that they found was the published values of a company rarely, if at all, actually tell us anything about what it's like to work in the company day to day. And so my first piece of advice there is make sure you're paying attention to as diverse set of information as you can, right? Don't just pay attention to your recruiter or your manager who's hiring you or a career site. you got to look at both the pieces of information collected and created by the company as well as those that are external to the company, right? What are other people saying about what it's like to work there? The employer review sites are great. Typically they're highly disgruntled employees, but there's a lot of truth in those, right? That you can ascertain. The other thing I like to do is actually find people who were at the company for a long time and have recently left because it tells you they were both successful there and they have a really deep sense of what it's really like to work there. And then there's just some interview questions you can ask, you know, things like, hey, tell me about the person, the real person who is most successful in this company today. Who are they? What do they value? How do they work? And then you can also ask about like what things happen here that don't happen in other companies you've worked at. And both those give you a really good sense of sort of the values that the company probably enacts, not just the spouses. That's like really that's. Those are great questions to ask during an interview. And they almost kind of go back to Joe's point about like presenting and looking a certain way in your interview. I feel like if I asked that during an interview, I would look a lot more solid to the person who I was talking to. Yeah, Brandon, I had a conversation recently. There's a list of interview questions I provide in the book. But I had a conversation with an early career um, individual who was like, if I ask these questions, am I going to sound really judgmental? or full of myself. I'm like, no, I think you're going to sound super smart. You're going to sound like you're doing your due diligence, which I've been on the other side of the evening process a lot. The more an individual is curious about the company they're getting ready to join, the more hard questions they ask me, I tend to like them more because it tells me that they are really centered, really thoughtful and super curious. And those three attributes are just highly, highly valuable in companies today. 
Yeah, and, and I'm and I'm going to add to that as somebody who has been going through that like job interview process. Currently, I have a position, but when I was going through that process, especially when you're young, it's tough to th- think about it in terms of like this is a mutual situation because you feel so hungry for getting a job, and you start yeah. thinking like, okay, I'm going to get this position and I'm going to try and do all these things. But then like you go and you start doing this and you realize that okay, this is actually a two way street, and that's something that's actually super valuable to understand. And Andre, I absolutely love that. That's the concept of your book because we kind of forget that there is a two way conversation here, but I do want to ask, cause you made a point about this uh, when you were talking a little bit earlier with the espoused and enacted values um, in terms of research, have you seen a difference um, in the espoused and enacted values within a company when the management changes. So do espouse and enacted values shift with the personnel that they have? Well, Brandon, it's a great question. Here's what I find more than anything that happens, right? Is you got to ask yourself first the question of where do values originate from? And so let's say that the three of us started a company, right? Those values emanate from just the way that we all decide to work together. We find a really innate way of doing our job together. And in that, we create these shortest shared sets of values and ways of working for the company. Now, look at this. Let's say that the three of us add 20 employees in our first year, 40 employees in our second year, and 20 more in our third. We just added 100 people. Those 100 people come in with their own ways of working, their own value systems, their own platforms they like to work from. And now our culture that really worked for us gets swallowed up by all these sort of diverse ways of working to come in the company. I spent you know, a fair amount of my career, um, a few years anyway, working at Google and they hired 27,000 people a year, right? Think about that. That's 27,000 people who are coming in this company. And if someone doesn't show them a different, more Google way of working, they just end up bringing their own things in. And so what I think what happens to culture, actually the reason the espoused values start to separate from what's enacted day to day is that we actually aren't reorienting people when they come in the company. We're letting them bring in all their stuff with us. So it gets more diluted than it does sort of happen with, with any shifts in leadership internally. So then like at a place like Google, when you have those 20, and so like, do you mean you let them bring in their own values and you just work with those values at Google because with those 27,000 people, like, does that get a little tricky? Well, think about it. I mean, I really, what I'm saying, Joe, is that if, if someone else doesn't show them the Google way of working, they're just going to work the way they've always worked. And so you end up having a lot of chaos, a lot of different ways of working across a lot of different functions in the company. And it could be any company, not just Google. I don't need to make an example of them. But what I am saying is if we don't do a really good job on telling people, hey, this is the secret decoder ring of success here. Here's the way that we collaborate, the way we solve problems, the way we sell in ideas, the way we give feedback, the way we manage conflict, the way we develop people, the way we socialize. If you don't tell people that, then they're just going to do it the way they've always done it. And so if companies want to stay differentiated, they want to create a place where people feel like they work in the same way. They want to lower coordination cost. We got to do a much better job on teaching people the system. You know, I did about 65 interviews in this, in this book with talent from all over the world at all stages in their career. And one of the most common elements was every time I joined a new company, I felt like I had to bump into the culture to figure out how to be a success. Right. I just got in, I started doing my job and then I had to go, my guy used to do this, but that doesn't work here. I used to do that, but that doesn't work here. And every time we do that to a new joiner, you know what happens to them? They lose confidence. They lose confidence. They lose engagement. They start second guessing themselves. And in the end, you have $7.8 trillion of lost productivity in the workplace. That connection, <laughs> the, it, it's kind of it's kind of interesting too when you put it that way. Um, when you talk about it in terms of people really having to fight that uphill battle when joining a company, and the first thing that comes to my mind, and we were kind of touching on this before the episode started, um, we love the field of IO, and another area of it is like training and development. And would you say that like that 
aspect of like a proper training process can train those values into their uh, into their employees when they join the company? I, I do. You know, Brandon, I was in training development for a lot of years of chief learning officer much of my career. And, you know, one of the things that I always marveled at is we treat onboarding or orientation, those two to three days you come in the company as something we need to move people through really quickly, right? Because you want them in their seat doing the thing they've been hired to do. My point's always been is, God, that should actually be a 30 day process, not a two day process. Because that's where people are going to reset the very nature of the way they come to work. And so what's happened, though, when you when you stand back from it all, there's actually three versions of the company being created. The first one is in recruiting. It's that aspirational version of the company. It's us at our best if we were on our best day in the world. It's the thing that you buy, right? You're like, oh, my God, I love this place. You come to the first day, and it's more of the company they want to show you you get to meet the best leaders in the company. You get to see the biggest stories of impact. You get probably um, introduced to the best and easiest to use systems. And then there's the company you work in every day. And that company often feels vastly different, at least when I talk to my interviewees. And so if you think about engagement, everybody, when they get a job, you'll be the same way. You can't wait to run out to your best friend, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your mom, your dad, and tell them how excited you are to join. And then every time we present a different version of the company, we're just eroding that excitement. I want want there to be an upward curve in the first 90 days. And right now, based on the interviews, it feels more like an EKG readout. (laughs) It's just up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And so we put you know, our employees at risk. And that's why you're seeing data, like 30% of new joiners leave their company within the first 90 days because of a lack of development, unclear expectations. And then even if they stay, the other piece of data we saw is that even employees that are there six months, they're still looking for a job. About 60 some percent are still looking for a job. And that just tells me there's a piece of work we have to do to bring people in the company to where they keep that excitement and that confidence all the way through that, those first few months, the very start of the process, one of the key things that I started thinking about was this idea of of what gets in the way of us choosing places where when we get there, the reality matches the aspiration. And there's a lot of things happening on the organizational side, but there's also things happening with talent. One of the most interesting ones, this is something you'll study in your program if you haven't already, is confirmation bias, right? Confirmation bias is sort of sits in between two things. One, what's the truth in the situation? And what's the outcome we want? And the overlap of those is what we see. And so often what happens is we will be so motivated by wanting to join a company that we pay attention to confirming evidence And we ignore the stuff that would tell us it's not the right place to be. And so one of the things that anyone interviewing at a job has to do is you have to get in touch with your spidey sense. That intuition that's a part of your attention system telling you this just doesn't feel right. Another thing that happened in the interviews almost always was when I was talking to people about the wrong fit experiences. Experiences that felt like they were always writing with their non-dominant hand. They were more stressed, less effective, frustrated, worried. One thing they said is, I asked them, when did you know? When did you know this was a wrong fit? And they said, you know what, looking back, there were early indications in the interview process. I just didn't pay attention to them because I wanted a job so bad. Either it was a great brand, I loved the product, the person I was interviewing with was really compelling. And so you have to stay centered and grounded through the process because choosing a wrong fit experience, that can limit your career for years. Choosing a right fit, man, that can be the greatest accelerator on earth. I feel like we live in a culture where it's like you want to keep applying for the job and you want to be successful. And then you're like, you get this job. And now that I have an entry level job, I can, you know, maybe get more of an intermediate level position and I keep on going. I grew up in an education family. So like my parents were teachers and I didn't really understand that process of you know, you work here for a couple of years, you work here for a couple of years. I always thought, you know, oh, I got to get a job and now I'm here for, you know, the next 40 years. Uh, so yeah. my, my question is, is 
how do you work culture and like right fit into someone's mind about like wanting to work with the culture at a company when in their mind, they're like, I'm at this job for a year and a half. So I can, you know, be at this position and then I'll be at that job for two years. So I could be at that position. Yeah, Joe, one of the things that again is in the book that is one of the probably the most compelling concept I, I sit with every day is that there's actually different types of careers, right? So you either have a career that's about a company that is you love a company or a product so much that you could never imagine yourself working anywhere else. You're of craft, which means you have a technical competency or a body of knowledge that you just want to become so deep in that you're going to be an expert in your field. That's three of us, right? I mean, I get into organizational psychology because I'm of craft all day long. And then there's people who are of cause. There's either a big challenge or a giant injustice in the world that they are just going to use every waking moment in their life to solve. That's many of our teachers, Joe, educators are generally of cause because they want to see people prepared for the world. One of the things I see often is that people don't know what kind of career they're trying to build. So they jump from job to job to company to company doing these things. And they're like, I'm not getting anywhere. And so for me, I start asking the question first of what kind of career do you want? Right. If you love a company and a brand, there's a certain way to build that career. You need to take as many jobs you can in as many different functions so you can both build a big network and fully understand how that company operates. That's going to allow you to be there for 20 years. If you're of craft, you can't spend your entire career at one company. And you want to be at companies that are on the cutting edge of whatever you're trying to do. And if you're of cause, you got to be wherever the movement is. Right. If, if you want to get in sustainability, there's certain places, certain people, certain organizations you have to be in. you got to go chase those. And so just back up everybody for a minute and say, what kind of career am I actually trying to build? And then instead of hopping from job to job every one and a half years, which is what people do, you might actually look at those durations and where you're headed a little bit differently. Yeah, definitely. You know, Andre, I feel like every topic we've discussed today we could all go in depth on for another hour <laughs> in different directions, <laughs> which is why you totally. probably wrote a book. Um, <laughs> totally. um, unfortunately, we could talk about this stuff for days, guys. Like we could be on here for four hours. So if you want to geek out after the end of the episode, I'm happy to. 100%. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but unfortunately, our listeners don't have as much time as we do. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to leave you with the same question that we ask all of our guests. Um, and honestly, this episode has been has kind of answered it, but I'd like to hear which, what is the key point? Um, what is like one piece of core advice that you would have for like incoming IO students trying to enter the field? I think there's a few, right? So I'd, I'd first start with when you come in, try to get really clear on the area that you both love and you're really good at, right? And those are two different things. Everyone tells you like, chase your passions. I'm like, don't chase your passions. Right, chase the things you're really good at. So I think taking those first few semesters and figuring out like, hey, what do I love and what am I good at? And making sure that you're orient your research towards the things you're good at, right? Because that's gonna just help you downstream in your career. I think the second thing, and this is something that my, my mentor back in grad school told me is get practical experience as soon as you can. Even if you gotta work nights and weekends. I mean, I, I barely had time to breathe in grad school. I got in and out of my PhD program in you know, under four years, I just busted my butt. But in that time, the one thing I made sure I did is I got practical experience. Cause then every class I sat in, I could both go, Hey man, I love that theory, but in practice, this is how the things actually start to work. And I was just so much more dialed about where to put my attentive focus when I was getting you know, sort of barraged with knowledge and books and research articles and all the rest, right? And I think the third one, and this is probably the most important, is those early career experiences matter, right? And they, they matter in sort of three different vectors. One, if you want to stay in um, the consumer space or in business, working for a really great brand that does this sort of work in IO psychology really well is highly valuable. Right. It just it allows you to break through any other sort of conversation or interview. I had Disney on my resume at the start. I mean, it just opened so many doors for me. 
I think the second one is working for someone who's a tremendous practitioner in the field, right? So my second job was at the Center for Creative Leadership. I worked under some of the greatest minds in leadership development. I was 26 and I just learned a ton. I was a sponge, right? And then the last one is, is really when you're, you know, when you're thinking about um, places to spend a long time, you actually want a place that has a lot of runway in front of it. Meaning some of my best career experiences were people that weren't doing the IO psychology work very well at all. Because you can walk in and learn what it's really like to change a system. And that is one of the most invaluable skills you can pick up if you're going to IO psychology, because that's going to be your job. And it's like pushing against the ocean every single day, right? So just learning how to do that's a really important thing for anyone in the field to, to learn how to do early and then just get a lot of experience over time. I think one of the, your most important piece of advice there was kind of having like that mentor so you could act as that sponge. I don't know if we've had that exact piece of knowledge here on this podcast yet, but I think it's super valuable because who better to learn from than someone that's in a position that you'd like to be in one day and who has gone through those trials that you will have to end up going through yourself. Uh, so being yeah. able to find that company, um, I guess it might be easier said than done, uh, but getting a, a mentor to really help you go through the task that you're going through, whether an internship or like your first entry level job is super important. Hey, Joe, and here's what I'd say to you on that note, right? Anybody that's of craft, and I can speak for myself and a lot of my peers is we want the industry, the practice to become better and more important to the world. And so anytime somebody reaches out to me, that's just starting out in the field, I almost always pick up the phone and try to try to help them along the way. Right. And so I would say to you know, anyone who's in the field, like find people that you might want to be someday. Don't be afraid to reach out to them. Because anyone that takes this field serious, we know that the only reason we are where we are is because we had people who did exceptional things for us early in our career. And our job now is we've sort of moved into the next phase is to pay that forward every day. And so I hope I speak to most of my peers who would say, reach out to us. If you're the next generation of practitioners, we're bound to try to give you as much help as we can. I think uh, Joe and I can definitely echo that testament. Um we have seen the outreach work for us because we've been trying to get so many people on this show and everybody's kind of greeted us with open arms. So it's kind of, it's been impressive and like honestly something that's been really inspiring for us. Um, our doors are always open for other people as well, but we're still learning. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but everybody around this field has really created such an awesome community where something like this podcast that two students at Hofstra can just start up and start up so effectively is because of the people that it's surrounded by. So like, uh, including you, Andre, like it, it's, uh, it's been something that we've really been able to, uh, to value for sure. Yeah. I mean, what a great, you know, I'd tell anybody, Hey, whether you're at Hofstra or any other, other programs, start a podcast or a blog or a newsletter, because again, to your point, you know, you reach out and say, Hey, we'd love to talk to you about your experience. Like people want to share. Um, and I think particularly in this field, because we know it can get really lonely really fast when you're driving change all day long. And we want you all to feel like there's, you know, there's runway ahead and there's just so many cool experiences. I said this at the start, I'll cl close kind of with it too, is IO psychology has provided me some of my greatest moments and most tremendous lessons. And I'm so happy I fell into the, to the space because it is just, it has made my last 25 years exceptionally beautiful and so i i wish the same for you both and for everyone else listening yeah perfect no one can do it by yourself that's why it's nope. uh brando and joe not just brando <laughs> or joe. that's a great it. finisher <laughs> but yeah. thank you andre for coming on um i'm very excited for people to hear this episode i don't think we've had i don't think we've ever talked about culture on this podcast yet um not that i can remember so it's going to be a really good one for people to listen to awesome man well i appreciate y'all having me thank you so fun. much you got it. Wow. So uh, that was a really, really valuable episode, I feel. I think our listeners are going to, one, need to buy that book when it comes out, and two, um, have a great resource in Andre because he had some really valuable information. Wouldn't you agree, Joe? Definitely. We haven't had someone talk about culture, like wrong fit, right fit on this podcast yet. Uh, and it's definitely uh, 
like a position in IO you can hold, they can hold some real value to companies, um, whether just being like successful in your life and actually like enjoying the work you're doing. So uh, yeah, I highly recommend just looking at Andre's experience and how he got to where he is um, reaching out. It was a really cool to have him on. Yeah. And as he said, he's more than happy to give information to people if they need it. And like we, we definitely have found that the people in our field are more than happy to help us out. And if they're willing to help us then they're willing to help you. And that's something that can not be understated. Uh, but thanks everyone for listening. Uh, it was great having Andre on and uh, hopefully we we'll see you next week. See you guys next week.